Okay. Well, thank you everybody for uh, being here. I have to make sure I'm in the right spot. So thank you everybody for being here. It's an exciting opportunity for us. SG Innovate was set up for a simple purpose, to try and help encourage <coughs> technically minded men and women that wanted to build what we would consider a deep tech product based on science and expressed through engineering. And we wanted to help those people that chose to be entrepreneurs, that chose to be scientist entrepreneurs. And our goal is very simply to help them in any way we can, help them with investment capital, help them with talent, help them with initial customers. We just want to be useful to those men and women that want to build something that we think could be technically and socially important. And of course, no conversation can take place today without the discussion of artificial intelligence. And as part of our commitment to community building and bringing people that have similar values and ideas together, we couldn't be more proud and more excited than to have Dr. Lee Kai-Fu, who's with us. And obviously, based on the fact that we've got many, many people that wanted to be here but couldn't make a, an opportunity to be here, we wanted to ensure that we bring Dr. Lee to you so that you can ask questions, be involved. I hope that some of you have had the chance to read the book. I enjoyed reading the book. And what I found was that it was a very easy read. Uh, and I found myself nodding almost from the first page. Because, and I'm not saying this to be uh, too agreeable, but I definitely have thought that China has in many ways already won because I do think that the commitment to using technology, unlimited data, unlimited talent, unlimited investment capital, and perhaps most importantly, an unlimited determination. So although many different countries have an aspiration and an ambition, China has been working tremendously hard. And I think Dr. Li and his work, both with Google and other leading firms, but especially with Sinovation Ventures and building entrepreneurs and investors to bring this to the market is a very exciting opportunity for us. So I have many, many questions that I've earmarked, made notes in the margin of my own book that I'd love to ask. But the most important thing is that we're available to you. So this will work as well as you want it to work. If you have questions, when Dr. Lee and I have the chance to speak together, I'll go to you early. If you don't take the opportunity, I have plenty of things to discuss, but it's uh, going to work best if there's something that comes from you. So with that in mind, I would love to now have the opportunity to introduce to you Dr. Li Kai-Fu. Dr. Li. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. Feels like you can give my talk for me. <laughs> um, it's really a pleasure to be here, but uh, it was a great introduction. But let me have someone else even more famous introduce me. It's a great thing to build a better world with artificial intelligence. So I think that gives you an idea what machine learning is capable of today. Um, <clears throat> uh, deep learning or machine learning, you can think about it as a single domain with a huge amount of training data, and it can achieve superhuman performance. That was a result of iFlyTech a speech company in China, the world's most valuable speech company. And that also shows the um, capabilities in China today. And when it comes to applications of artificial intelligence, I separate them in my book into four waves. It's the same set of algorithms that run these four waves of um, applications. The first wave is obviously the internet wave that is using a huge amount of data within an Amazon or a Facebook and optimizing an objective function. In the case of Facebook, perhaps the minutes per user. In the case of Amazon, perhaps the total revenue or profit per day. And at the second wave, it moves on to using uh, data that's been in a repository for a business, perhaps a bank, insurance company, a clinic, government department. And that can be turned into a mountain of gold. Before, it was just a storage of <clears throat> a call center. But now it can be used to predict customer behavior, to maximize revenue for banks, and do a lot of things. Perhaps the best way to illustrate 
is to not to show you so that you don't think it is simply a matter of traditional companies using AI. Let me give you something that's a little out of the box. We invested in a company that built an app for borrowing money. And that app, of course, you type into it your name, address, how much you want to borrow, how much money you make, your net worth, where you work, etc. The typical 10 or so things you would enter in any loan application. But what it also does is asks for your permission to upload things from your phone. Um, before you get too concerned, it doesn't upload anything that Facebook or Google uh, or Amazon wouldn't ask you to upload. Basically, your apps, type of phone, things for debugging, um, your contacts, etc. And based on all that information, it makes the de determination whether to lend the money to you. So essentially, it's lending money to a stranger. So can you imagine if you had 500 sing, and you go outside this, this um, building, and at the next 3,000 people who come by, pick 1,000 and lend them 500 each. So that's 500,000 sing out of your pocket. What kind of a default rate do you think you'll have? 80%? 90%? Okay, maybe it's Singapore, 60%. <laughs> but very high number. Now, our app has the default rate of 3%. And that is the power of AI. And that's something banks can't do. Because among all the things it uses to make the determination are 3,000 parameters derived from what you enter and your phone. Not just the items you enter but how long did it take you to enter your address? And things from your phone, like the model of your phone. What kind of apps do you have? Do you have games or do you have serious apps? And also, um, um, how much memory is on your phone? What day of the month is it? Is it before payday or after payday? And it would have things all the way we actually peaked at the least important feature. It was your battery level. That turned out to be important too. Not too important because it's the least important feature. But you might think about someone who habitually runs on the battery that might be slightly correlated with someone who doesn't return a loan. Uh, obviously, that is a very, very, very unimportant, but nevertheless still useful feature. <coughs> then what the learning algorithm does is on the 3,000 dimensional space, it would basically draw a three a very complex surface which separates people who tend to return loans versus those who don't. And it is with that precision, the ability to use 3,000 features, correlate and decorrelate them, and make a very complex choice. And that is something no human being can possibly do. Um, and hopefully that explains why AI is so powerful. The third wave is using uh, computer vision, computer speech, and other sensors, sensor that might capture your temperature, your movement, your 3D um, <clears throat> dimensions based on various types of sensors installed in the room. Just using the camera is pretty powerful. Uh, those of you who are fans of Jackie Chung, Zhang Xueyou, anybody? <laughs> May have read the recent news that he has a nickname, Policeman Chung, because when he gave four concerts in China in the stadiums, they connected the entry of the people coming in with a camera, and the camera captured every person and connected to a database for the security of the concerts, just checked if there were people on the most wanted list. And as a result, some number of people were apprehended, and when they showed an ID that says, no, I'm not that <laughs> most wanted person, they were let go, but in the end, 30 people were arrested. So that kind of capability, think again, would any number of police people possibly recognize from a database of three million faces and spot them out of the crowd? Even though there are some false alarms, that's not something humanly possible. So again, AI is eclipsing our capabilities without any doubt. And of course, the third wave also goes into autonomous stores, autonomous schools, not fully autonomous, but using uh, uh, computer vision to do uh, things like taking attendance and autonomous um, elderly home, making sure it's safe for people, watching if people fall. Um, and in stores like Amazon Go, we've seen that you can do user face, user intention, user grasping, user buying something, and add 
all of that combined together to help the store uh, basically charge people. Then we move on to the fourth wave, which is autonomous AI. That is, the AI is able to have movement and manipulation. So things like in a warehouse, being able to pick things and put them into a box. Things like washing dishes, not, a dish, not just the dishwasher, but putting everything and it actually can automatically, robotically separate them. Uh, anybody want that? Okay, we'll take orders with the book. It's $300,000 each, <clears throat> US dollars. And you might say, well, how would that ever be popular? Well, every product begins by appealing to people who save money and make money with it. High-end restaurants in America that have eight or nine dishwashers could easily um, get the money back in one year by paying $300,000. And with volume, prices will come down and also with autonomous vehicles. That, is, that will dramatically change the way we transport ourselves as well as logistics and delivery work in the future. It'll be more efficient, convenient, save us money, and also um, are safer than human drivers. Maybe initially a little bit safer, but over time a lot safer as it accumulates more and more data. So these are the four waves of AI. So in order for the four waves of AI to work, as I mentioned, we need a large amount of data and uh, very accurate objective tagging in a single domain and ideally with large amount of compute with some experts. Speaking of experts, uh, one would first think of all the American and Canadian leaders. These are the world's best researchers and experts. So one would think US should be ahead in this uh, US-China. Um, <clears throat> and if you look at the number of high H index authors, the US outnumbers China about 11 to 1. So why, should China, why would China have any chance at all? So let me first give you three conceptual possible misunderstandings, although I think the video already should have done that for you. Uh, the first is that in the history of um, machine learning or AI, there really hasn't been that many breakthroughs. There has been one giant breakthrough in the last 62 years of AI, and that is deep learning. And that big breakthrough, plus all the enhancements, are reasonably well understood. They're not in, held in the minds of some 500 or 1,000 super experts, but they are open sourced and available. And as a result, we're no longer in the discovery phase. I think when you look at magazines and see breakthroughs in medicine, Go, poker, and so on and so forth, you might think we're having rapidly increasing number of breakthroughs in science of AI. But actually, no. They're all built on the same technologies. These are just new applications. So the advantage actually doesn't go to US, but goes to China, because China is better at building applications, and US is better at research. You could ask, well, why can't there be a research breakthrough? Of course, there can be. But I think what we already have now constitutes electricity. And have we ever got in electricity 2.0? No. If we did, would that be great? Yes. But we, it's not clear we need one. Um, if you look around you, very few companies you know are actually using AI. So the opportunities for implementation is tremendous, unbelievable, exponential. And whether or not a great technology breakthrough might come, we can ignore that for now and monetize and build and implement and create value. And should another breakthrough come, to the extent it's public domain, the whole world has access to it. To the, to the extent it's limited within the walls of Google, then good for them. They'll make a lot of money themselves. But anyway, the big thing is we're ready for implementation. And all of this technology is largely available <clears throat> in various types of open source repositories, uh, such as GitHub. So there isn't some kind of art barrier from one country to the next. And if we think about the five requirements again, for, because of these three reasons, for many applications, the last requirement is actually dropped. You can substitute young engineers. And we already saw earlier, and here's another example of the, one of the 300 students uh, eight students together built this autonomous vehicle. It actually ran in the uh, campus of Peking University. You can have it go from any building to any other building. It would um, 
not hit any people and recognize uh, people, uh, bicycles, and uh, skateboards, and so on, and, uh, and, so and obey the street signs, despite it's not open road. This was done by eight students with no prior experience in the industry, and often no AI course ever taken, just five weeks. So that is the speed in which a smart young engineer can pick up and do something interesting. So look to fill in a little bit more detail about China, um, given these three basic reasons, we also see that the Chinese papers are substantial. They're about 42% of the world's publications. The very, very top ones might still be occupied by the US, but the numbers are coming in from the bottom of the pyramid. Secondly, Chinese companies are becoming innovative. They were copycats 15 years ago, and maybe 10 years ago, China started building competitive products, and today, China has innovation. These new products here, um, Toutiao, Douyin, Kuaishou, VIP Kid, Mobike, uh, and Financial, Pinduoduo, are products that don't exist in the US. F totally Chinese creations. And the total value of the orange column, 300 billion US dollars. So Chinese companies can innovate, and that has effectively led to a two parallel universes, one with the American technologies, one with Chinese technologies. The innovation has gone so fast and so furious that the Chinese internet is essentially a parallel internet to the United States. And if Chinese companies can innovate, Chinese entrepreneurs can innovate. But they innovate using a very different approach than the American entrepreneurs. Very much focused is the speed of iteration, the tenacity, the winner take all. Um, example is in the US, there are companies like Yelp, Groupon, uh, OpenTable, and Grubhub. Um, in China, there's no way those four companies can, con in parallel, survive. One would take over, winner take all. And that company in China is called Meituan. Meituan is a $50 billion company worth about four times more than the four American companies combined because they dared to change the way the Chinese people eat. They figured out that the way to change Chinese people eat is to give them 500 restaurants delivered to their home within 30 minutes at 70 US cents per delivery. And if that is done, people will eat out less, they will cook less, and, and Meituan would dominate. But the process of building that up is painful. It's about hiring 600,000 people with high turnover, uh, getting electrical mopeds, helping them change batteries, a very ugly, challenging issue that the light capital intensive Silicon Valley um, frowns upon. But China sees that as the way to build a impregnable business model. Because China used to be full of copycats, and there's still quite some copycats. Copycats will copy products, they'll copy features. So the only way you can win in a winner-take-all environment with copycats around you is to build a product that cannot be copied. Features can be copied. Technologies can be copied. When people saw something that's already done, they can figure out how to do it because you've already proven by empirical example it can be done. I remember when I watched Google Maps with amazement back in 2004. When a month later, Yahoo did exactly the same thing. So once somebody does it, it's not so hard to do it again. So the only <clears throat> barrier that is impregnable is to put so much money, resource, and build such operational excellence, chipping away a few cents a month until you get a 70 cents a month of uh, a delivery. That makes it impossible for your competitor to copy, unless they want to burn $5 billion and do all the iterations that you have done. So that model of innovation is maybe not as glamorous, um, as, as elegant as Steve Jobs, as Fred Terman. However, it is effective, and it builds barrier, and it's arguably a better business model. And that's what the Chinese companies and Chinese entrepreneurs have excelled at. And all of that will be carried over to AI, because it is those entrepreneurs, those VCs, those kinds of companies that will now integrate AI, accumulating data, and quickly find all the ways that the society can use AI to make money. There are also more money being poured into to Chinese AI. 
um, and the Chinese companies are rapidly accelerating in valuation. This slide shows you the five unicorns that just my company, Sinovation Ventures, have funded. Um, and they're totally valued $21 billion. Uh, we didn't fund them after they become a unicorn. We funded them at Series A. So you can see in the just, and all of them, with one exception, were founded in the last four years. Uh, the, soonest, uh, the most recent one was founded just two years ago. So two years to unicorn, three years to unicorn, four years to unicorn. This is the speed, tenacity, and the growth that we see when we have a market like China's. Now on to the actual most important advantage, <clears throat> data. In AI, the more data, the better the results. Um, you can try different methods, but data always gets you better results. As my friend Yen Lu would know, we both uh, heard from a famous researcher in speech, there's no data like more data, which is what we always celebrated in AI, and that later I can give you a quiz on who said that. Um, very famous figure, by the way. Um, and um, if in the, so in AI, um, data is the new oil, that means China is the new OPEC. We see China having more people on the upper left, but also more, that's breadth, but also more depth, more usage per user, more takeouts ordered, more, more uh, shared bicycles ridden, and also more mobile payments paid at 50, 10, 300 times more than America. So you've got more users times more usage. Mobile payment in particular is a very big one. Uh, last year, mobile payment in China actually exceeded China's GDP. And you can see here in the farmer's market, you even see beggars holding up signs that says, I'm hungry, scam me. <laughs> and cash and credit cards are almost not possible to use in China. This all becomes rocket fuel for Alibaba and Tencent but also for the merchants and for the app developers who now know who paid you for what. And that is the most valuable data on the internet, more valuable than browser clicking because you paid money for something. And of course, the government plays an important role in China's rise. Um, China uses what I call a techno-utilitarian approach to technology support, that is, in order to get adoption of technology, Chinese government's willing to let it launch and then watch it and then decide how to regulate it. Uh, in, many, in the case of um, <clears throat> um, mobile payment, uh, in the US, probably Visa and MasterCard would cry foul, saying software companies have no idea how to manage money and they could be hacked, they could be frauds. Um, but Chinese government said, let's give Alibaba and Tencent a try. And when they were proven capable, they got to continue. That is not to say the government is always, pro, always technology forever. In the case of cryptocurrency, the government did step in and regulate. So it is, um, because it is able to execute rapidly, it can let something be tried and then regulate when proven necessary. Um, the state council has set a tone in AI in this document in last July. And that basically said, AI is really important, one of the national priorities. Um, but that, that document actually doesn't have a budget with it. The budget is with the banks, the state-owned enterprises, and the cities. And with that direction, the banks were buy, bought more AI software, one that we, our invested company produced, and we noticed that. And some cities would say, let's build an AI park. Some cities let's would say, let's bring AI for manufacturing. Yet other cities, like Xiong'an, would be a brand new city the size of Chicago that is being built with a downtown that has two layers. The top layer is for people, pedestrians. Bottom layer is for cars. That's one way to avoid what happened in Phoenix with the Uber autonomous vehicle. And <clears throat> as autonomous, ve autonomous vehicles launch, we know with more practice, more data, they will get better and safer. So the very critical question is, how safe is it when you launch? And when you separate the pedestrian and the cars, you might be able to launch faster, thereby giving China an advantage. So where are US and China? So this is strong like a zero-sum game, but I do want to point out there is no zero-sum game. 
Chinese AI companies and mobile companies sell to Chinese companies and consumers. And any gain they have does not come at the expense of an American company. But nevertheless, we can measure which country has more market cap, more revenue, more users in the use of AI. And as you can see here, in the last uh, five years, China has rapidly almost caught up. And in the next five years, it will probably, probably lead the U.S. That's in implementation. Research is different. Let me now switch and, and talk about as AI gets adopted throughout the world, it will create a tremendous amount of value. PwC estimates um, AI will add a net 15.7 trillion US dollars to the world's GDP as a net addition. And that would be great in reducing poverty and hunger. But it would also bring about a number of issues, including privacy, security, data bias, monopolies, um, and wealth disparity. I don't have a lot of time, so let me focus on just one, which is job displacement. As we talked about, AI is single domain, large amount of data, superhuman performance. So now think about how much of the world's labor force is doing single domain optimization, white color and blue color combined. Probably none of you are, but probably you also realize perhaps half the world is engaged in such types of job. So if AI gets adopted everywhere, those jobs will be displaced. And if we draw from the most repetitive routine to the most creative and complex, we will see that these jobs will be doable by AI in the next 5, 10, or 15 years, leaving only complex jobs that are not single domain or creative jobs <clears throat> or creative jobs like scientists that AI cannot do. And here are some examples of white collar and blue collar displacement. White collar displacement is an announcement by Citi. It's laying off half of its back office and replacing them with AI. And in the case of blue collar, we have two examples. Both are investments. The pastry scanner you saw in the video is able to take a tray of pastry and instantaneously scan and charge you for it, and thereby displacing one machine for one cashier. And the other example, F5 Future Store, you also saw in the video, is a um, Chinese food robotic maker that is a fast food place that's about one-third the price of McDonald's. So while this store doesn't displace any human jobs, to the extent it gains share against McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken, jobs will be lost when they take off. So the jobs issue is a substantial one, with many people losing jobs. What We can't possibly let everyone be a CEO or be a scientist. So we have to think, what are the things that AI cannot do? We've talked about the creative and the strategic. Another aspect is that AI has no emotion, love, compassion, and empathy. There are many jobs that we expect and want that, and AI cannot do that. Even if AI faked it, it won't fake it very well. Even if it faked it okay, we don't want it. We just want a human in many such circumstances. So those are the kinds of jobs that will remain. Uh, plus, there's a third category. These are the jobs created by AI. And you might ask me, what are they? And I will tell you, I don't know. It's like when internet first came about. How could I have, or anyone, have predicted that so many people would be driving Uber and DD, right? So, so new technology always creates a lot of jobs, but we just don't know what they are at the time the new technology is adopted. But what is known, with, what's different about AI is AI does all routine jobs. So AI, by definition, cannot create more routine jobs because any routine job it creates, it will do it by itself. So it can only create jobs that require some degree of creativity, non-routineness, complexity, planning, or compassion, or empathy. So with those two as the two main things that AI cannot do, <clears throat> we should really have two axes. One showing the level of creativity of a job, one showing the level of compassion and empathy required by the job. So the various jobs could fall into the three quadrants, 
the right two are pretty protected. The left, lower left is pretty dangerous. But let's not forget, there are compassionate jobs on the upper left quadrant. Those jobs, we don't want machines to do. We want people to do them. We don't want machines to take care of the elderly. We don't want machines to um, be nurses. We don't want machines to be nannies. We want humans to do those jobs. So therein lies the possibility of job creation from, as people are displaced from the lower left. So this chart basically shows uh, the four quadrants corresponding to four types of um, human machine coexistence. The lower left showing jobs AI will ultimately take. The lower right shows jobs where AI can be a tool to help scientists be more creative. The upper left shows possibly AI as an analytical engine with human providing the warmth. Think about doctors or teachers, where the doctor might use a diagnostic engine, where the teacher might use a homework assignment giver or grader, as we saw in the video. But the doctors and the teachers will become more one-on-one -on -one with their patients or students, giving them worth, warmth, mentorship, care, comfort, and in the case of doctor, higher likely of recuperation. And of course, on the upper right is where the human compassion and creativity together shine as we get a little bit of assistance from AI. So that is, this one is the blueprint for human AI coexistence. As we look beyond the next 20 years, we have all these challenges and opportunities. But if we look a little bit further out, when your children um, grow up, uh, I think things are going to be different. I think we'll recognize two things. That while we may face a lot of challenges, I think your children, when they grow up, will find two things. The first is that AI is really good because it came to liberate us from having to do routine jobs. Your children may not have to do routine jobs again. So they can do what they love and find what it is that makes us human. The second is, for those of you who are still a little bit scared, uh, AI is just a tool. Uh, we are the masters of AI. We define AI's objective functions. AI merely optimizes. We are the only ones who have free will and the only ones who can write the ending to the story of AI. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Lee, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was so excited to introduce Dr. Lee that I failed to say thank you to our friends and teammates from GIC. So uh, please forgive me for that. But thank you to my friends and teammates uh, from GIC for helping us make today possible. I have many questions that uh, I'm personally excited to ask, but I'm going to try to restrain myself because uh, I'd like this to be a community event. So from that perspective, what I will do is I've got Slido in front of me. For those that would like to post a question, and I've got my own questions here, my uh, well-worn and dog-eared copy of uh, your book where yes. I marked up in the uh, margins, but I've taken the liberty of making some notes. So I'll ask one or two first, and then I'll go to you. And to respect Dr. Lee's time, because he has multiple commitments, our goal is to finish uh, around 4.45. Right? OK, uh, if I may, Dr. Lee, when we yes. talked about computing power, uh, we talked about engineering talent, and your comment was the quantity of data, therefore, becomes really the differentiator. When we think about data, there's good data and bad data. Does China have the ability, just through sheer volume, to be able to sort of brute force the improvement of algorithms, even though the data may not be <coughs> the best? Yeah, so it's... Um Mostly yes and sometimes no. So in the case of many kinds of data, it's self-labeling. So in the case of, um, let's say, Alibaba or Tencent, um, the data is not bad, be can't be bad, because it's labeled by the human. Because we as users are guinea pigs. By clicking and buying, that's the label. So that's, by definition, outcome-based labeling. That's the best kind of label. Any company with outcome-based labeling can't go wrong. The example I gave earlier about the, the loan app is also outcome-based. It's trained by whether you default or not. Not a human who labels it. 
when you resort to human labeling, you have an issue with expertise. So the health data becomes an issue for China because you, while you could use uh, progression-free survival as a metric, it takes a really long time to know if someone has um, you know, survived cancer or not. And that delays progress. Whereas if you use doctors, then the Chinese doctors may not be as good as the top American doctors. Also, in the longitudinal data, such as treating cancer treatment, there are steps that the doctor takes. The initial uh, treatment, the response, and the effectiveness, and then the next treatment, and then so on and so forth, um, and then the final outcome. So if the doctor's not good, the data becomes poison in the beginning because the first treatment may be wrong. So that's where I would worry about Chinese, uh, uh, at least cancer treatment in China, because the quality is substantially behind the US. But in most cases where you can get outcome-based data, I, I don't see any uh, deficit. One of the things that <clears throat> you mentioned in your book, moving from the age of discovery to the age of implementation, and you also spoke about it in your comments now, is it inevitable? if I can think of it this way, that those that implement more actively, that learn more iteratively, will by definition become uh, not catchable, if I can think of that expression. But it, it, the lead continues to build because the iteration, the reinforcement continues. So in some ways, is the game already over? And some people may not simply realize it yet? Um. The game in the internet space is um, n not too far from over, but um, China has not won, right? We've basically split the world into two parts, China and the parts that it influences, and US and the part that it dominates. Um, so the internet has become two parallel universes. Uh, the China part you might think is only China, but it's actually starting to go into uh, Southeast Asia, um, Africa, possibly Middle East, maybe India, and possibly South America. So I think if we push five years from now, I think we're likely to see every country to be either more using Chinese software or American software. Um, the game will not, the two parallel universes won't, won't ever be over, won't easily be over, because it's hard to cross. It's hard for a giant from the China scene to go to America, or vice versa. So I think we'll end up with a duopoly with US and China um, basically become the largest beneficiaries with a lot of concerns for other countries, uh, especially poorer countries that don't have prospects of building um, AI-based or technology-based companies. What is the role of other countries? Every country aspires in different ways to be economically <coughs> and socially successful and relevant. Yeah. But without the scale, either of the research or the implementation, what would be the role of countries in Africa or Southeast Asia or in our own home country at the moment of Singapore? Well, it's a case by case. I think where the country has some technologies, for example, Canada, I can see them becoming a power to be reckoned with. And their national strategy makes a lot of sense, except for one thing. They want them to target Canadian businesses first. That will doom their strategy because Canada is such a small country from a business size data standpoint. They've got to target US companies and users. And, and as long as they don't get that, their strategy won't work or it won't work fully. They might have 2% market share of the world when they could have maybe eight. But no, they're all single digits because China and US have taken the great majority. Now, I think Singapore can make some bold bets. Um, one is that ASEAN, Southeast Asia, does emerge as a region. That's obviously in question, because there are many sovereign countries, uh, not all of whom are friendly with each other. They all have different cultures and languages. But if, if Singapore dares to make one big bet, that's not impossible. At least it's worth pursuing. Another bet is Singapore has a large population of Chinese-speaking people. So strengthening the linkage to China in some way, that might be another link. Um, and also, there are other things to think about. Singapore has a very effective government 
with a small size, uh, with a country, small country size, where a new infrastructure might be laid out. So as to give it some advantage. So these are some of the possibilities for Singapore. I think each country should definitely do an inventory and come up with a plan. Um, the default outcome, though, is US plus China will take 90%. Let's talk a little bit. We've talked about data. Uh, GDPR in Europe and the idea of protecting data and privacy of data in many ways would run <coughs> counter to this argument that in China's case, more data is good. Um, how do you, as a investor, strategist, uh, as a person who's built AI, how do you look at policy decisions such as those taken by the EU to try and partition and protect uh, data? Does that immediately knock the EU out of any relevance in terms of anything other than a user of something that others build? Um, not necessarily. So <clears throat> let's first evaluate GDPR. It's a terrible set of um, protocols. Um, none of us, every one of us, I bet, if you ever go to a GDPR compliance site, don't you just click yes? Has anyone ever clicked no? I mean, why would you go there if you click a no? So, it served no, it basically nullifies itself the moment it's launched. However, I do think giving users some control over privacy is good. But I just think it needs to be done at a different granularity. And, uh, and actually, I do applaud EU for putting a straw man forward for others to shoot at and iterate. So that part is OK. Um, whether it gives disadvantages Europe, um, yeah, I, th I think it does. But, um, but if they build the right GDPR, it could actually become a new form of protectionism, right? If they build a really good GDPR and then help European companies build it properly, so let's hypothetically say, this is impossible, but let's hypothetically say we can truly let each user own his or her data and then license it to companies as needed. And that will completely mess up Google and Facebook in Europe, right? And then if there are enough European companies that actually build decent products based on that assumption, then, then the third superpower will have emerged. But I was just fantasizing. There's no chance you, your EU would ever do that. <laughs> that links in many ways to your comments in the book about the fact that Western companies have historically, as a model, built something and then tried to sell it into other markets, yeah. whereas <clears throat> the China entrepreneur, the China-based entrepreneur says, what do I have to do to make money? So I love the idea of mission-led or mission-driven versus market-driven. Yeah. Perhaps you could touch on that, please. Uh, sure. I, I mean, I personally greatly respect mission-driven companies. That is what has made Apple and Google um, great companies. Now, that isn't the only way to build companies. Um, I think China has a number of historical reasons. It's um, poverty in the many centuries ago, uh, families wanting to uh, use the opening up to have a chance to change the plight of the family. Uh, Deng Xiaoping's sta uh, famous statement, let some people get rich first. I think all of these basically create a gold rush for the Chinese entrepreneurs to work as hard as they can with a singular goal of winning, of making money, of bringing family out of poverty, of becoming number one. I think brings out that competitiveness and the tenacity and that makes China a very unique place in the world, maybe one of a kind to have that kind of acceleration. Uh, now, over time, I think it will probably um, mature and people will no longer be as tenacious or work 100 hours a week anymore, but I think it's got another 20, 30 years of run behind it. Let me go to Slido because there's many, many <coughs> questions. Um, a question that's received many upvotes. Uh, Dr. Lee, you paint a positive picture of AI, yet there's people such as Elon Musk, famously, that talk about it in terms that make people anxious. Um, I know you've spoken about the fact that it's not the Terminator robot you fear, but the social disruption because of unemployment and changes in how we define ourselves. Perhaps you can touch on your views. Yeah. Well, <coughs> I 
Well, Elon Musk makes two sets of arguments. One set is that in optimizing AI for some objective function, side effects happen that could be damaging. I think that is true. We're already seeing Facebook under a lot of attack. They optimized for minutes per user, or total minutes, or whatever they optimized. But in doing so, it pushed either fake news or news that are prejudicial upon people, which is not good for the user. But it was just not a factor under consideration. So that kind of accidental, um, non-objective function-oriented tainting of the society, of the people, of the users, uh, is an issue. I'm a little doubtful it would lead to an existential problem, but it is an issue. But where he and many other famous people talk about AI becoming so super smart through singularity, eventually, or actually quickly, dominating us, and we become the toys or in the video game, um, I think that's um, just not the case. Uh, we, we are so far, those of us who have worked on AI, know that we're so far from reaching that. All we have are smart pattern recognition systems. In order to get to what they're talking about in the sentient AI or the AGI, we have to overcome so many problems, like training on, limited, training on no data or very limited data, like um, cross-domain reasoning, understanding common sense, the ability to do planning and strategy, and um, also uh, self-awareness, emotion, uh, empathy, so you can list out 20 breakthroughs that are needed to get there. So the case for singularity is non-existent right now. Um, however, if we see two breakthroughs like deep, um, like, like, um, deep learning next year, and four breakthroughs like deep learning the year after that, I think I'd be open to re rethink my position. But right now, we've been nine years since deep learning's invention, and so far, not another one. So with such exa extrapolation, simply based on commercial applications, that's growing rapidly. It is not a technology growing rapidly. If I go to another one here, and I'm going to bridge off the question asked and, and weave in something. The question <coughs> is about uh, gladiators and fierce competition and network effect. Let me build on it slightly. You talked about the importance of the gladiator entrepreneur and the war of the thousand groupons. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned it, but didn't necessarily dive into it. I thought it was a very impactful statement yeah. for why China is in such a strong position. Because the copycat has built a very strong, resilient, merciless entrepreneur that now can turn his or her attention into use cases for AI. Perhaps you can touch on this a bit. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I, I think China went from copycat <coughs> into builder of very strong lean startup companies that are able to find product market fit and then went into um, innovative companies that are based on the knowledge that grew from that. So the copycat, actually, there are two parts of it. I think Silicon Valley uh, frowns on copycatting so much that it led to a very um, strange marketplace where if someone did something, you just don't do it or don't do something like it because people will frown on it. So companies like eBay get to survive all these years. In China, they'd be killed by the Amazon ages ago. I mean, you, you all know eBay is using old technologies, nothing that Amazon can't do in a very short period of time using its power and brand and technologies to wipe out. But, um, but I think China um, actually is built on the um, winner-take-all mentality and assumption that both internet mobile and mo internet slash mobile and AI have. And given it is a winner-take-all environment, it makes sense to, for the competition to be fiercer. And somehow the Americans um, don't, don't get into that. And I think the Chinese model is a superior model. I, I obviously, in my book, I also talk about some practices that go too far. And, and I think China is now uh, self-correcting. Um, but I think the model itself is completely valid. Uh, you just have to you know, make sure it's done 
without IP theft, without you know, ethical issues. <clears throat> when we think about this idea <coughs> of technology, and technology CEO, certainly in the West, and I think also in China with leaders like Jack Ma and Robin Lee and others, uh, sort of reaching a, a mythical status. Uh, currently, technology is under some pressure in the United States, either because of regulatory and legislative or just perception, and at the moment the market is, uh, is, is pushing technology down. You talk about universal basic income a little bit, this idea. I want to come back to this idea of what does it mean to us as people, because the technology and the improvement or the application is one thing. The downstream effect of the haves and the have-nots, uh, I think that's an important topic. Perhaps you can expand, please. Sure, yeah. <clears throat> I went kind of fast in the presentation, so I didn't get into it. The, I, I think uh, some of the people in Silicon Valley proposed the use, um, uh, they saw the same issue that I saw, that there would be a skill set dislocation, that people doing routine jobs would lose their jobs, but they're not easily going to find another job. So their solution was universal basic income, which means give everybody, let's say, 15,000 US dollars uh, a year. And, and um, everybody, including everyone in the room and everyone displaced. And that would replace all social welfare um, as, as well as give all the people a, ch a buffer for them to learn new skills and start again. But I think that is drawing on the idealistic roots of Silicon Valley people and then that they extrapolate their brilliance on every inhabitant of the planet. Um, when you listen to Mark Zuckerberg give the Harvard commen commencement where he said, if I ever had lost everything, I just need a buffer to rebuild another great tech company. But what he maybe didn't realize was he's Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, he's not a fruit picker somewhere in Kansas, right? So I think yet at the same time, so, so, so just giving people money um, has a lot of issues. First, it's very expensive, um, that, that is obvious. Uh, the second is that, well, where would you get it from? Massive taxation, right? And that will be difficult to implement in some countries like US. Um, and the third biggest issue is that um, people's jobs are the mean, often the meanings of their lives. And when you take the job away, the meaning goes away. When you just say, oh, you're, you're, you're the quote unquote useless class. We've seen some author use that term. And I think it's very, very dangerous to use terms like that because essentially you're telling people you are useless. You will never get a job. Previously you thought you were uh, useful because you were a fruit picker. Now we pick by robots and you are totally useless. And in order you don't go hungry, here's $15,000 a year. This is guaranteed to lead to social instability. It is guaranteed to lead to um, high percentages of depression, suicide, substance abuse, um, um, addiction to games. And this is all demonstrated with plenty of data based on people who've been unemployed for prolonged periods of time. So I think the simple idea, simple idea of just give them money is solving only a tiny part of the problem. The bigger part is what is the meaning. Now for most of us, it is too late to change the meaning. Most of us have attached our job to be the most important or one of the most important parts of our lives. So therefore, the only solution for those of us who are already stuck on that belief is to retrain and get a new job. So that is the only solution. Now, longer term, it would be nice if people didn't um, feel work was the only thing that's important in their lives, but that's longer term. In the short term, you can't change that fruit picker in Kansas. You just got to retrain and help him or her find a new thing to do that he or she can be proud of. It's, uh, it's <coughs> so true because when any of us go to an event, we tend to want to identify each other by what we do or our yeah. title, you know, hi, I'm Steve, I am the whatever. And that's, yeah. so now this new world, some people imagine it that we'll all choose personal pursuit and like to study more of this or that but this idea of purpose is not a small issue right. and the technology uh, coming our way. China has also made a statement about 
its determination to be a leader in both the production of and the utilization of robotics. How do you think about this intersection of this thing we call AI, as well as the manifestation in robotics, which if you think of embedded systems and where automation could go for China and others, do you think of those in the same sentence? Do you think of them completely separately? <coughs> the same. Um, I would put that in wave four. And uh, clearly, China is caught up in waves one and three. In wave four, it's behind. In wave two, it's behind. Um, US has a lot more technologies in robotics and autonomous driving. But as you saw in the, some of the demo, China is catching up as well. It just takes a little longer to catch up in those areas. What is the power of face in this issue? Uh, perhaps because I've lived in Asia 18 plus years, I tend to think of it as China has a lot of face associated with its growing leadership and pride in AI, which I think is under uh, appreciated by yeah. companies or countries outside. So is there an environment in which China will not, to ask it in the negative, is it inevitable that China with its determination in robotics, the Made in 2025 plan, One Belt, One Row, anything you take, it's inevitable, so to speak, that if because of face or anything else, China will achieve. It's not a question of if, it's simply a function of enough commitment, enough people, enough money, just as the US program <coughs> for NASA, which you highlighted, People died in pursuit of getting to the moon. Amazing hundreds of new discoveries had to be mm. pursued, but it was so important that every consequence was acceptable. Is that a similar, where every consequence is acceptable in China at this moment? Oh, I, I don't think so. A state council has multiple plans. It has a very big plan on uh, reducing poverty. So every city is going to adopt its own subset of state council plans. So it's important. I, I don't think it's, it's quite at that level of um, do or die. Also, will China definitely win? I also think there's a question mark here. I think to the extent that <clears throat> there are breakthroughs, I think US is most likely to make those breakthroughs. Uh, I just don't think breakthroughs are that easy but it's certainly possible um, in the next five years, probable in the next 10 years, likely in the next 20 years, there will be one or two more big breakthroughs. And to the extent they're done in the US and they're protected somehow, either by the company or by patents, I think the whole picture I painted could be changed because uh, US will have something that it has that other countries do not have, especially given the current state of um, um, you know, nationalism and tension. Um, I also think U.S. has uh, substantial leadership in semiconductor, which I didn't go into in this slide. Um, and, but I just think when we go into, when you talk about internet, mobile, and AI, U.S. and China are just parallel universes. When you go into semiconductor, they're intertwined. So I'm not sure how that leadership will translate to other things. A brief one. Uh, we've talked a bit about vision because it's part of pattern recognition. <coughs> and we have a general understanding of that. We've talked about natural language. We haven't talked as much about touch. Uh, how do we think about this aspect of touch as another sense that is developing within this larger field of AI? Uh, do you have a perspective? Are you looking at companies, and perhaps I missed it, so forgive me, but the idea of being invested in companies pursuing touch as a sense associated with AI? Um, yeah, I, I think um, if you look at how much our data pipe is driven by eyes, ears, touch, smell, taste, um, obviously the vision is the largest part. <coughs> Sound is the next largest. And then touch is one of the smaller ones. Maybe the next one is touch, I'm not sure. So, um, so that's something, I, I'm not sure what's meant by touch. Um, well, you, is it example, robotics? There's, there's research in Singapore right now. There's a team that's working on with hundreds of sensors within a given space, how to improve an artificial skin proxy that then would cover 
uh, robot that would improve uh, what, what is it that I'm touching <coughs> and how do I process what that is as part of my larger context. Yeah. No, I think that's an important sensory input. Uh, there are many other types of sensors, uh, gathering, uh, temperature, movement, um, TOF, and, uh, you know, structure light. Uh, those are all, as well as touch, are all valid things to do. Um, I, was th I was thinking you meant multi-touch, so yeah, that, yeah no, that, that's interesting. Um, but to carry that a step further, um, materials and touch and grasp is a very important part of robotics. And if that isn't solved, a lot of the projection I make are off the table, right? Because a very basic one is when Amazon sends you the, the box, uh, you know, they have these Kiva robots that move shelves of things, but the human grasps them. And, 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 and having sensitive touch that doesn't break a glass, but they can grab a watermelon, how do you do that? I think that is a very important part of robotics. Okay, I'm going to, with the remaining time that we have, okay. take the same pivot that you took in your book. Uh -huh. uh, which is we've talked about the technology, we've talked about the role of different waves and research versus <laughs> implementation. One of the things that struck me in your book was you talked about AI allows us to reflect on who we are and our humanity. Your personal story yeah. and how you reevaluated your priorities uh, based on uh, a, a personal event in your life I think is a very important aspect of our discussion. Would you be comfortable to share more? Sure, sure. If you've seen my TED talk, you know, you know that part of the story. Uh, I've been a workaholic uh, most of my life. And um, examples I gave are um, I would wake up at 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. to answer all the emails so that my Google or Microsoft colleagues in the U.S. were, were feeling I was responsive and that my employees were feeling like they had to work as hard. Um, I almost missed my daughter's birth because we had a presentation for John Scully, remember? And um, fortunately she was born, but I would have missed the birth had the doctor not ordered the cesarean. So those are crazy things that I have done in order to reach accomplishments in my life. And it was not until uh, five years ago when um, I was diagnosed with a fourth stage lymphoma that I, it changed my outlook because once I was diagnosed, uh, first going through the denial uh, phase and acceptance and so on, but once I accepted, um, I saw that all that hard work was for really nothing. And that um, if, if I had a few months to live, I wouldn't want to spend one minute working. And, and I would want to spend it with the loved ones, I would want to spend it doing things I love, and I look back and my whole life, I really didn't do too much of that. Um, I did some, I did enough to get by, enough to get passing grade, but uh, never with the uh, intensity and priority that uh, my family and my friends deserved. Um, so I told myself I was not going to let work dominate my life anymore if I could be in remission, which I am, um, that I would spend time with my family and that I would prioritize the giving love back to people who love me and even giving love to people um, without unconditionally. That would be a priority in the things that I would do. I would still work hard, but only after I satisfied the high priority needs of, um, of giving love as the top important thing. So in the context of my talk, I skipped over a bunch of slides because we had a limited time, but I would have gone into um, my personal experience, what caused me to realize that. And you know, after <clears throat> I re, um, went into remission, I immediately wrote a book about changing priorities in life and what I learned from cancer. And that became the worst selling of all my books. It, it did sell okay. It sold you know, 200,000 copies in China and largely given by people to others who have cancer, <laughs> saying, I don't know what gift to give to you, so read this book. 
he recovers, so maybe he's got something. But that wasn't the intention of writing that book. But, but that was also when I realized the Chinese people are just in a phase. The Chinese entrepreneurs are in a phase of history where they were not going to listen to this. They just have to build their destiny and legacy, and workaholism is the way of life in China. And I can't change that. So when AI came along and promises or threatens to displace all routine jobs, um, I came to a different conclusion than most AI researchers. And I thought I should write it down because hopefully it could um, not only inform people what AI is and can do, hopefully it will also help people get out of believing that work is the only meaning of life. Um, because repetitive work will be taken away by AI. And you, people have better find something else that's important. And there must be a lot of things that are more important. And I tried to throw in one more time my personal experience, hoping in this book it could make a difference. Well, just not that you need anything in terms <coughs> of my feedback, but briefly, my eldest girl is finishing her master's degree in genetics counseling. She's joining a startup in California that's building an AI interface. My first reaction, what are the implications? Her point is, I spend the first 45 minutes of any consultation gathering data. Your grandfather had what? Your grandmother had what? Wouldn't it be great if the AI were allowing me yeah. to focus on that human discussion yeah. and all that data can be prepared for me so that I can use my time to speak to this couple that's sitting across me. So I was thinking of your upper left-hand quadrant, yeah. this idea of a tool <laughs> surrounded by the empathetic <coughs> human. So I, I, I'm living through that very much myself. I think in the interest of Dr. Lee's time, uh, I would just like to close with, in addition to everything you've thought of, this opportunity for us as we think about AI to reflect on our own humanity yeah. and what does it mean for us is perhaps for me personally the area that I took away most from your book. Well, thank you. Thank you for us taking such um, <clears throat> deep insight and sharing with, it, with, with us. And you're one of the best readers of my book. I appreciate <laughs> it. Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Lee Kaifu.